Hello everyone, welcome to the second season of Design Inspire Talks. I'm Kadambri Sahu, your host, founder of Design Inspire platform and SVP Design at Palo Labs. Design Inspire is an initiative to connect designers across the global design community. And Design Inspire Talks is a presentation and discussion series with passionate, innovative and inspiring designers. It dives deep into their passion, inspiration and what makes them go. It is an effort to understand how they are navigating their career path and how they are investing their creative energies. We believe hearing their bold moves and inspiring stories will ignite interest and inspire the next generation of budding designers across the globe. So let's go forward with our guest today, Jay Kaufman. Jay Kaufman is a head of product design for Size and Fit at Zalando, where a multidisciplinary team leverages data science to give customers meaningful size and fit advice by gathering accurate clothing data and building a trusted and even intimate relationship with customers and their bodies. Jay previously worked in design operations, hiring and growing people, structuring teams, building community, shaping culture, and optimizing workflows. During Jay's tenure, the company-wide product design team grew tenfold. At Zalando, they also founded the new defunct juggling guild and the still uh, sitting meditation guild. So let's uh, uh, go forward and welcome Jay today. Hi, uh, Jay. What are you doing? How are you? Thanks. I'm I'm doing well this morning. I I had my meditation and I had my jogging, and then we had a really nice conversation before this. So I'm, I'm feeling good. It's ten in the morning here, and I'm a morning person, so uh, I'm I'm in my element. <laughs> wow, that's great. Uh, so Jay, the format of the show, I'll just explain to you a little bit. Uh, so we have like two parts to the show. The first is the presentation of your choice. I would like to know your story or anything that inspires you, motivates you. Uh, so that would be the presentation. And in the second half, we'll chat a little bit. We'll discuss about your design journey um, and things that matter to us. So can't wait to uh, you know hear your presentation. Let's go forward. Yeah. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very honored to be here today, uh, design, at design inspire, uh, the word inspire, uh, feels like a little bit of a high bar. I'm a little nervous about that, <laughs> but maybe I can lower the bar a little bit because, um, as a meditator, inspiration has a certain meaning that's tied to spirit and to breathing. So, um, in like old middle English, um, the term inspire was used to mean breathe or put life or spirit into the human body so it's it's inspiration is really about the breath and uh last time i checked i was still breathing so so if everyone here listening is breathing too and uh, then we'll have at least some some level of inspiration here so and in terms of what i want to talk about i chose to talk about a project that we did around professional development at Zalando. Actually, I've done several projects around professional development at Solando, developing a career matrix and so forth. Um, and I today wanted to mainly actually present a framework that we used, um, that we developed at Solando to talk about professional development. Um, and it's actually a little bit ironic that I talk about professional development because it uh, wasn't something that was really on my mind for a long time. I early, early on, I never wanted to have a career. Um, I wasn't very intentional in my professional development, but I do notice looking back, I was always passionate about growth. I was always interested in learning something new. I mean, so for example, when I was at university working on the school newspaper, I was like throwing myself into learning new skills. You know, I started as a writer, then was doing photography, then was doing like editing, but then also got interested in graphic design through that and learned that. Or um, juggling, I mean, you mentioned that I founded a juggling guild at Zalando. Um, you know, I, I think back, you know, when I was learning to juggle four clubs, I was hurting my hands a lot and I was dropping a lot and I just kept kept at it, kept doing it um, because I think we must as humans have some innate desire to learn. We have this innate desire to grow. And I think back to those times too, and we also grow together as, as communities. So I'm really grateful. For instance, I, I think of like this one juggler in the Seattle juggling scene that I was part of um, named Dick Curtis. I'm really grateful to him because he, when I was just learning more, you know, he was like 30, 40, uh, 30 years older probably than me. And with, you know, very patient with me when we were learning like three handed, uh, two handed juggling, uh, passing patterns and so forth, um, passing clubs with each other. So that kind of ties into um, also the Zalando story, which I will now present. So we came up with this, this motto around becoming better together, 
based on this idea that we learn together, but also based on our founding mindset. So we have um, a principle in our founding mindset, which says, make us better, not bigger. So maybe as some background, Zolando has an amazing story of growth. <laughs> you know, for in the first 10 years, um, it went from like two people to over, I think, 15,000, um, you know, from zero revenue to over 6 billion, now we're at eight. Um, you know, so it's, it's an amazing story of growth and you can't help but grow um, when you're in the company, you go along with it. But we wanted to emphasize that it's not just about bigger, it's also, it's mainly about better, right? And I think that that's true individually as well. Maybe ties back into my development career as well. I was not so interested in titles, you know, climbing a certain ladder, but more in terms of like learning and becoming better and not necessarily bigger. So um, another important aspect to consider is that career paths are not a ladder. And this is certainly very true in my own case. You know, it's been kind of a, it feel, felt intentionless, but in looking in hindsight, there were a lot of synergies that happened too as I followed my passions. So everyone has a different journey. And last time when I gave this talk, which I'll give a link to later because I'm trying to do it different this time and mix it up. I said to, uh, you know, uh, start with your heart in terms of, you know, following your passions when you develop your career. Um, and this time, actually, since we started around this conversation about the breath um, and inspiration, I'd maybe revise that to say, you know, start with your breath. You know, what gives you life? What gives you spirit? What, what brings out the energy in you? And that's the way that you can then chart out your professional growth journey. So <clears throat> this, this journey is, is built around different levels of, you know, starting with where you stand, your anchor within your values, um, and then figuring out the direction you want to go, thinking about you know, what your purpose is, and then developing where it is you want to go from there um, out of these things. So this is um, kind of a framework that I like to use to talk about professional development, is to find this, this overlap. So really to kind of come to the ground, where are we as people and where are our companies as, as organizations? So you know, at Zolando, we have something called our founding mindset and other companies as things called leadership principles and so forth. There's um, value statements from different companies. So what are the company values and what are my values? I find a really interesting self-reflection exercise as a pre predecessor to um, thinking about your own career development. And when you can find the overlap between those areas, that's kind of where this sweet spot is that you can really um, emphasize and, and leverage uh, to grow. And then at the next layer, um, there's various kind of tools in the internet for developing your own personal mission statement. I actually have, I have mine here that I, I, I keep on cards that you know, has like different, you can walk through like my, my mission statement uh, uh, to keep it at top of mind. Um, it's something that, you know, I really live by kind of principles and so forth. I really like this kind of, this kind of way of looking at it. I think for, for most people, it is helpful to, you know, take a step back and figure out, okay, what do I admire in other people? Um, and what does that mean to me? And what do I want to do? And what kind of legacy do I want to bring? So there's different ways of looking at a personal mission. And then within a company uh, too, we also have various missions at Solanda. We want to become the starting point for fashion. Within various teams, we also have certain kinds of mission statements and, and so forth. And then, um, you know, then out of that driving career goals, both near and midterm career goals are something that I think a lot of frameworks talk about. We don't necessarily need to go into that, but what I wanted to emphasize again is the overlap. So there's, there's a lot of um, different directions you can go within your career. And I think what makes sense is to leverage where you are and to make the most of that. So to figure out, okay, you know, what, what, what are the business goals that I'm working toward? And how do those align with my career goals? And I think, I mean, in my experience, maybe I'm just too flexible, but in my experience, you can, I can always find an overlap there. Um, even in, I've, I've worked for companies that I didn't have very much kind of moral respect for, 
but I was still able to find certain kinds of certain kinds of overlap and passion in places where I could move the needle in ways that aligned with both the company and my own individual needs. So, and that's the space of doing, um, which we'll come back to um, in a moment, um, because it's around that we have a idea of um, learn, do, and share as a as a flywheel for professional development. So, but first, maybe just a little bit of a conversation about building on strengths. So as early as like 1967, there's the management Peter management guru, Peter Drucker, um, uh, identified that we should build on our strengths. And the research just keeps piling up from there. So there's a researcher, a psycholo psychologist at Harvard named Tal Ben-Shahar, who has also um, you know, done research in this area in terms of positive psychology. And um, he, for instance, said, most people instinctively believe that fixing our weaknesses is what leads to the greatest return. It's not just a little bit wrong, it's actually totally wrong. So the, there's some for research, for instance, that if your manager is primarily ignoring you, the chances of you being disengaged are 40%. If they focus on your weaknesses, uh, your chances of being dis disengaged are 22%. But if they focus on your strengths, you'll, your chance of being disengaged at work is 1%. So between one and 22% is a pretty big jump in terms of whether you focus on your strengths or your weaknesses. And I think this is also something that we as individuals can take on to ourselves too. It's not just the environment we're in, but we can also focus on our, on our strengths and learn and grow from them. So there's an article called 10 Reasons to Focus on Your Strengths from Psychology Today that is quite interesting that... Uh, but translating this um, to a design community, what does that mean? So I like to think about you know, different areas in which we um, want to grow or different skill sets of designers. I mean, so you could put UX, UI, writing, you know, research um, and, and so forth kind of along this, or you could put different aspects. This is actually more of a, of a concept and not such a, not such a strict like um, spider diagram, right? But the idea is it, there's always certain, certain things where we're a little bit weaker and certain things where we're a little bit stronger. And the question is, how do you want to develop in your career? So if you want to become like the unicorn designer who's good at everything, um, you know, good luck. And, and, and I just feel like if you strive for that, um, you're going to end up kind of okay at everything. That if we really like really work to emphasize our strengths, that this is the way we can really get really interesting uh, designer profiles and really different designer profiles, unique profiles that match our own specific um, personalities and proclivities and skills. And that this also benefits the team in the end because if we have all have these unique strengths, then when we come together as a team, that's the, true starburst. And that's the, the team is the star, not the individual. So this is a model that may or may not be helpful for thinking about how you apply strengths within a team environment. Then going back to the Zalando story. So we had a working group that met to identify a framework that we could use to foster professional development, looking at this overlap between individual interests and the business needs in an intentional, aligned, and balanced way. Intentional meant that we really wanted to focus on strategic capability building and be principled about it. Aligned meant that we wanted to do this across um, the product insights and design team and the job family, and together with our human resources, which we call people in organization or PL. And balance meant that it should um, provide a guidance toward the best return on investment, also from the company perspective, um, but also in a fair way. Um, so this is this is what we set out to do, and we had a series of like three um, founding mindset, uh, or three tie-ins to the founding mindset that we worked with. So one of them was ownership. So. At Zalando, we say ownership is about being responsible to our customers, partners, and colleagues, not about being entitled. We own our destiny and, not, and are not stopped by circumstances. Zalando is what you make of it. So this, this um, 
for me, it's, it's um, important that we as managers don't fully put things onto individual shoulders. But I think as individuals, it's also important that we do own it and drive our own um, career development. And then um, we also have a principle called high challenge, high support. And I think that this is also a really good baseline for professional development to put your environment, put yourself into environments where you are being challenged a little bit, maybe beyond your comfort zone and where you get good support for growing in that environment. So, you know, um, yeah, so this is a good place to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting back out of, I have some like talking points to run for Londo here, but this is, not, this is not about us, this is about you. So I'm uh, trying to make it relevant to everyone here. So this is out of our experience. I think what's much more interesting, maybe uh, more universally, is this learn, do, share loop model that we came up with. So the idea is that, you know, while learning, the whole loop is about learning, um, but we couldn't think of a better word to describe, you know, the things that you bring in as skills through books and talks and courses and so forth. So this kind of formal learning is a part of any kind of professional development program and important and also a certain starting point. However, doing is the heart of the learning loop. So practice makes perfect. Um, there's um, and this idea in the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell that you know you get build expertise by putting in the 10,000 hours of work. I know there's like different um, pushback against this idea and so forth, but I think that if you take on stretch assignments, hone your craft, practice your communication, your empathy, and your soft skills, that this is what happens. These are the strengths and habits that we build up in our day-to-day -day work. So any meaningful skill. Um, you know, juggling four clubs is maybe not meaningful, takes a lot of repetition, but any meaningful skill at work also takes a lot of repetition and a lot of doing. And then sharing is also about learning. It's also about paying it forward. So, so learning by, by teaching is really powerful. And it also is kind of a flywheel here in terms of enabling other people during their learning. <clears throat> So that then they become sharers, and then we're we're making the whole loop um, feed itself, which is um, a really nice uh, place to get to. So that's kind of the the goal that we set out is to really kind of focus on learning by doing, and really enable this flywheel of learn to share. Another interesting kind of model, maybe for the community is some thoughts that we came up with about the scope of seniority. So we were trying to simple, simplify down very complex kind of career matrix that we have into what does it actually mean? So if you look at different titles or job grades that you could be at, um, we looked at one side <clears throat> at um, the product that you're working on. So what kind of impact do you have um, at you know, a product level? So, you know, the more junior you are, maybe you're working more at a teacher level. And as you get more and more senior, you start working on projects, products across different products, and maybe building platforms and ecosystems. And the other side of this equation is the organizational or personal side. So when you're junior, you should lead yourself um, and, you know, and, and contribute to your own development. Um, as, you're, as you're growing, um, you, you, impact you you have this influence that you exert at, at broader and broader levels of your organization or maybe even um, we could say um, the industry so you could go from yourself to the team and outward in outward circles and maybe the the in if we become gurus uh if we're don norman or julie cho maybe we're also influencing the world or the industry as a whole so that um, so that was um, the better together uh, conversation. So basically, to foster professional development, we want to do this in an intentional, balanced, and way, and to grow better together. So we will, and I will. We'll share this deck um, that you can look at these resources afterward. This is something 
um, based on the research that shows that um, relationships at work are super powerful. Um, this is a worksheet for exploring your own personal values. And there's another option for looking at values in action or a purpose statement finder or a role expectations kind of example for myself. In this book, The Alliance is a, um, a book that frames something called the tour of duty, which is where a lot of these ideas about the overlap between the personal goals and the business goals comes from. And there's an interesting book also uh, by Dan Pink. Um, that's a career guide. It's, it's, uh, it interestingly brings a lot of these like kind of big insights, like build on your strengths, not your weaknesses into a very pithy cartoon form. And if you want to know more about my own path, um, you can ask in the Q&A, but also um, there's an article that I wrote about the accidental design manager, about how I happened onto a career when I wasn't looking for one. And a, a, a different version of a talk about the professional development framework with some different focus and, and so forth you can find here on Vimeo. And so oops, at this point, um, we'll go into interview mode and uh, I really appreciate the chance here to speak with you and to enter into dialogue. That's the even more fun part. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, I, I resonated totally with your thoughts. Uh, some of the ideas that I had in my head, I think um, you sort of brought it out in terms of, you know, more articulate forms in terms of, you know, sort of matrices and, you know, uh, the diagrams. Um, yeah. Um, um, Jen, do you want, yeah. So let's go to the next format where uh, we'll chat a little bit on the design journey and uh, loved your presentation like you know how you you sort of articulated most of things you know how for example influence and fact and things like that uh, and i'm sure the tools that you've shared today uh, you know on the presentations can be very helpful for people looking at you know um, what is the overlap or you know where they have to go and things like that so i think it's a useful uh, resource uh, uh, that i think uh, people can access um, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, like, uh, you know, coming to design itself is something that people, most of the people uh, have literally stumbled upon. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the interviews that I talked about, people said that, okay, they didn't, didn't know that they wanted to become a designer, but something happened in their life and then they decided to be one. Uh, so how did it work out for you? Like, how did you think that you'll become a designer one day? Yeah, I touched on that briefly, actually, at the beginning of this um, talk when I was talking about working at the student newspaper. Mm -hmm. So what happened for me as I was, well, maybe I should back up a tiny bit. So as a teenager, I was really good at math. Um, and I was really into, like, for instance, programming my Apple IIe and so forth. Um, but I noticed as I got to be an older teenager, I was really interested in literature and reading and writing. So I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. And I, I became like through this passion with writing, I, I became the editor in chief of my student newspaper in my junior year. So in my third year of university, I was editing the, the school newspaper. And during that process, I realized actually what I loved most about it was like laying out the articles and everything. <laughs> so then in my senior year, I became the layout editor, the like the managing director instead of the editor in chief. Um, and this is where I kind of like, got this passion for graphic design. So I kind of, you know, started reading and teaching myself certain things and um, got my first job as a designer then um, after I got out of university. So that was a very interesting moment where, where I moved from words to um, images and, and text in, the, in, the, in a graphic sense. And what were you graduating in? Like, what were you learning uh, at that point of time? Uh, what were your education, uh, passions of art? I studied, at that time I was studying literature. So I was studying English literature um, or English language literature. Mm -hmm. And um, and then later actually, so I, got, I went back to, to university later and got a second degree in sculpture. Mm -hmm. So I studied art as well later. Oh, wow, that's great. Can you talk about your creative journey, like, you know, after the college, uh, uh, from there on to, you know, currently where you are? Sure, yeah, so, um, yeah, so maybe picking up on this, I got my first job as a graphic designer in a newspaper. Actually, first I started as a, as a typesetter. Mm -hmm. So um, I was also really passionate about type. Uh, typography is not such a, like, 
topic that many people are passionate about anymore today. But um, and uh, so I became a typesetter. Then I was kind of a graphic designer, you know, like kind of low level graphic design, like designing like ads for new weekly newspaper and so forth. Um, and um, doing editorial layout design and this kind of thing. And then I, I noticed this creative passion tied to art. So I went back to school to study sculpture. And this was the, this was in like 93, 94, or 94, 95, 96. So in 1995, um, the internet came out. <laughs> And I was really interested in the internet as an artistic medium. And so I, I dove into it from that perspective. And then I had these skills like programming HTML, which were very useful in industry. So, you know, I had this job immediately where I was actually hired as an HTML programmer. But then from day one, I realized, well, nobody's taking care of like the issues of layout and the issues of usability and like these kinds of things. And so I was I basically became what we now call a UX designer or a product designer, a digital product designer. So I, I threw myself into reading, you know, so Alan Cooper's first edition of About Face had just come out. So I read that and like uh, subscribed to Jacob Nielsen's um, blog and, you know, read Tog's things and, you know, it's kind of these early kind of gurus within the, in the, the user experience space. And then, um, yeah, then I worked for three different startups in Seattle um, and then moved to Berlin 18 years ago. And, um, and here in Berlin is kind of where I made this transition from designing to management, which you can read about in, in the article that I mentioned earlier. Um, so my creative journey is interesting to look back on. It's, it's had some very interesting waves. and. A lot of my creative energy now gets put into, you know, establishing frameworks for people to develop in their careers and things like that. So um, it's a super interesting expansion. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, you've been in these different roles where you've been in the, like even moving from like, you know, creative side of it to operations and management side of it. Just wanted to know that you have moved from design operations to design uh, management. And I'd like to understand what's the difference really uh, between the operation sides of things and design management. Mm, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think it's important to have an overlap there, right? Uh, my big mantra right now is we are all ops. So, you know, as a, as a design as a design ops person, mm -hmm. I thought felt like it was my duty to enable the design management round. Mm -hmm. As somebody now who's part of the design management community, but not centrally responsible for design ops. I also feel like it's our responsibility to support all of these things. And I, I think that, that that overlap is super healthy because the closer you are to the actual work of managing people, the better you are to contribute to the mechanisms for doing that. And so in my case, design ops was a little bit kind of also like of a chief of staff function for, um, for our senior vice president of design, Anne Pasquale. Um, and um, within moving to design management for me personally, what it means now is the ability again, to get deeper into the product and deeper into the design of actual customer experiences, which I really love. <laughs> Okay, so we, we did talk about like, let's say design operations and a little bit uh, about design management. Would you want to like, you know, sort of uh, define each of these terms and then also compare them with design leadership? So how are these three uh, things different? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, different? so I mean, I feel, like, I, I feel like sometimes as designers, we overthink things a little bit. We, we like to change the language around things every few years. You know, we used to be human computer interaction and now then we were user experience and now we're product design. and I feel a little bit like this, this design operations is also, there's something real to it, which is about enabling design to scale, which is super relevant for a lot of organizations today. So I don't, I don't want to like write it off as a fad, um, yeah. but in a certain way, the terminology is something that I, I struggle with a little bit, especially with the word leadership. So, yeah. so I, I feel like, um, a lot of people say everyone is a leader, right? And it, it, there's, there's leading yourself, there's leading others, there's leading on a project basis. And for me, the difference is like, if we think about it in an organizational context, 
leadership is something that you do regardless of your role and that we expect of both management and expert contributors. So I think that so we have, so at Zalando, like technically speaking, like leadership would be both management and principal track yeah. experts in engineering or design or whatever discipline. So that, that I think is kind of a nice concrete way to define leadership in that way. But I think leadership is also, lead, to lead is also a verb and something that anyone can do. Um, management, I feel like is, it's this servant leadership. <laughs> it's like where you're doing kind of like some of the work that other people don't want to do to make them more effective at what they do do. Um, where you're supporting people, where you're really kind of orchestrating people, helping people. That's, that's what I see as kind of the focus of, of management. And operations is really um, about bringing together principles and 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 formats and systems and and mechanisms in order to scale design, to make managers and contributors more effective. Sure, I think thank you for you know uh, clarifying and also talking about you know how they merge. I, I think there's no boundary, right, Jay? You can't like we can't classify that. Okay, now I'm a manager or now an operations person. And for uh, people in leadership roles, I think I think they end up doing everything, right? <laughs> they end up doing everything in between, yep. you know, from yep. ideas to concepts to maybe vision to ecosystem. And I, that's why I loved your presentation, but you have put it out there, where you look at, uh, you know, uh, the influences and maybe the impacts that was there. Uh, I think that kind of, you know, sort of talks about a certain things, uh, which is very well articulated. Um, now talking about uh, you know taking a little uh, you know changing the gears from there and talking about design managers right um, we all want to one uh, at least in the organizations and uh, we want them very effective at the same point of time you know uh, the job market if you see um, looking at you know the job descriptions I think uh, they do a very bad job in terms of defining uh, how a design manager could be or how you know mm. generally I'm talking about. Uh, and that also affects like, you know, um, uh, you know, what kind of portfolio they should have or what they should be talking about. Um, and I think uh, with you having, you know, so many different roles that you've taken uh, and, you know, written mm -hmm. about, you know, about a uh, portfolio for design managers, just wanted to know about, you know, what are your thoughts on what, uh, you know, things should be added for a design manager portfolio and how they should go about, you know, talking about it. Right. Uh, yeah, a good question. So, and I haven't revisited this topic for a little bit for a little while, so maybe referring back to my blog article, I think, yeah, I, I forget what the title of it is, but if you refer, refer back to that, maybe I have better ideas than what I have spontaneously here. But um, I, I'm a visual person, and I like to talk about artifacts. And so um, um, I'm looking around to see if there's anything here in my space that I could show as an example. But I feel like you know. As a design manager, if I look back on my career, I have like, you know, a career matrix that I created, or I have, um, I have, um, you know, a set of principles that are defined like design principles for, you know, designing with data or these kinds of things. So I feel like we, even as managers, we have artifacts of our work and sometimes it's a little bit less tangible, but I think if we can try to make that tangible in a portfolio, to show not just what we did in terms of the customer experience, in terms of the business KPIs, um, but also, you know, if we can kind of tease out some of these artifacts, it helps to concretize, concretize is that a word? Helps yeah. to make more concrete the conversation that a design might, manager might have in an interview process, for instance. Sure. Uh, and let's say if we are in, like we both are conducting, let's say, a, 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 for a joint venture uh, to recruit a, a design manager at this point of time. So mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, what kind of questions we should ask design managers and uh, what should be the expectations from them? Uh, because in industry, I think, you know, uh, the nothing is, uh, in design industry, I don't think that there's a standardized set of anything. And that shouldn't right. be, I think, you know, every... Every company, every team, everything, every organization may have their own needs. But just just looking at uh, like you know a broad perspective of what are good qualities or what we should ask a design manager. What do you think? You know what we should look mm -hmm. at when we're looking at a design manager. Yeah, let me think. Um, 
So one of the things I think is important is to maybe ask what they look for in uh, designers um, and how they how they see the team. Um, I think it might be important to ask questions that drive toward how they establish psychological safety in their team. Um, it's important to ask, um, you know, how how they create more inclusion within their teams and maybe within the hiring process, how they ensure diversity within that, within the within the, the hiring funnel. Of course, there's at the at the ground, at the at the foundation, there's also like, you know, how did you impact customer lives and like and business KPIs? So um, that's just a few thoughts uh, off the top of my head. Sure. Uh, shifting again gears now uh, to Zalando and uh, you know the, the amazing fashion e-commerce that it is. Um, so do you want to talk about a little bit how to design for a uh, fashion e-commerce space and what needs to be considered while designing you know such kind of experiences, product or services? Um, so designing for fashion is a question and how that differs to other domains. In a certain sense, I feel like as designers, we're not necessarily tied to a certain domain, right? Like I think we have skills that are translatable across different domains. Sure. And even if we're working in a certain um, certain field, like let's say fashion e-commerce, people tend to think of the consumer experience. But we have a lot of work around designing partner experiences and designing even employee experiences, for instance, in the warehouses. So, so designing the warehouse software. So um, so it's a very heterogeneous field. So I think that there, there's a big variety of things that go on there and things to consider. So that's that's kind of one answer. Another answer might be from the more personal direction. So um, for me to design in fashion e-commerce space is in some ways maybe difficult. Like maybe difficult is like the headline because I mean, for me personally, I'm not such a fashionable person, um, but I notice that like, it's actually quite good because I've understood more about fashion by being able to observe it from a little bit more distance and you know not make it about me. So I think that's one of the standard user experience uh, rules, right? Is uh, it's not about what you want, but what the customer wants. And so that's maybe actually also a benefit in a certain way. But the other aspect of it is that um, fashion e-commerce is difficult in, in several other ways. It's a very complex space. So like I said, there's there's all sorts of logistics concerns and backend systems and partner relationships. There's all sorts of things to consider. So it's complex, which is great um, if you want to challenge. And then um, fashion is also, or e-commerce is difficult um, in terms of an environmental impact as well as fashion. And then you put fashion and e-commerce together and they also have a lot of kind of implications for how do we do this in a way that doesn't impact the planet to in a negative way so and these are these are big problems um, that are really interesting to try to solve <laughs> i think that's why i love zolando like you know the, the kind of mission you guys have the way you put uh, out articulate things the inclusivity everything is like just just spot on like i i really love that you know you might not have all the answers today but you know, the way Zalando is going about is really inspirational. Um, so, and also you're working on a very, uh, you know, uh, unique, and I, I would say like a very important place uh, um, in, in, in the field of size and fit, and you're currently heading mm -hmm. to size and fit. Um, I just wanted to talk about like, uh, when you're, you're looking at size and fit, about the opportunities that is, it has in terms of social impact and customer experience and how, and maybe even the planet and society. <laughs> so, I mean, for the, for the planet, it's a little, it's pretty straightforward, right? So if yeah. we can reduce the amount of size related returns, then there's less transport involved in the e-commerce experience, and then the planet wins. Um, I mean, that's also a benefit for the customer experience because customers don't like the hassle of going to the, the post office or the, the delivery office to, to return a package. And even if we, you know, even if we do home pickup and so forth, it's, it's still, they have to be home. So. So, so this is kind of, you know, in a sense, our lighthouse KPI is reducing size related returns. So that's, that's something that benefits both customers and the planet and the business, to be honest as well, um, right? Uh, it, it's really good for the bottom line as well. Um, when you start to tease out what kind of social impact can size and fit have, 
I mean, many people have, let's say, not the most healthy relationships with their bodies, or they don't have you know, a certain body image and these kinds of things. And the fashion industry has been really um, powerful in establishing some of these unhealthy body ideals that we have and so forth. So within size and fit, I mean, just one example um, that we've seen is that avatars might be a really powerful way to it bring more diversity into the into the user experience and be able to show more different body body types in a way that is um, quite scalable in a way that bringing in more diverse models is more difficult. So, so within the size and fit team, I think we have some really interesting ways that we can also build toward a more inclusive customer experience. Well, um, great ideas there. Uh, I think uh, let's talk about a little bit that you touched upon uh, on the carbon footprints, right? Because fashion industry and even e-commerce both are you know, contributing a lot to that. And uh, uh, definitely when designers sitting uh, at, the, at the center and Solando and you, know, you have a great design team there, uh, so what are your ideas? Like how, how's the team, design team and Zolando helping to solve this challenge? What are your ideas about that? So I'm not sure if I'm the best person to talk about this because you know while we are contributing within size and fit to a small degree to that, there's yeah. a sustainability design team that's really, that's really focused on this. And we okay. also have a design team within the connected retail space, mm -hmm. which is also you know, working with um, physical retailers um, and to mm -hmm. also enable enable them and that they play into this to a certain degree as well mm -hmm. so actually maybe rather than saying anything i'd just uh, direct people to the zolando sustainability page so on the zolando web page corporate website mm -hmm. um, there's a whole thing about um, sustainability and we have um, for instance um, for instance we did um, a study um, that we actually made public around sustainability um, and it's, it's called like the attitude behavior gap report. So we noticed that, you know, customers say that they want to help the environment, but they don't act in ways um, like that all the time. And so one of the questions is, you know, how we as a company can help people to act in accordance with their higher ambitions. <laughs> so, um, so there's something called the sustainability progress report that, that goes into that. And you can read about, you know, how we, you know, I mean, on the business side, we're also, you know, within the operations of our business, we have certain commitments by certain dates to um, reduce our CO2 footprint. And um, yeah, so we have a whole kind of sustainability strategy called do more. Um, last week chat at VV also talked about like some of the amazing technologies that you guys are uh, working uh, with for the size and fit or mobile applications and you know the different kind of things that uh, mm -hmm. you guys are using for. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's public knowledge that we acquired a company in Zurich that has an app um, that does um, body measurements. So, so basically by taking two silhouettes of your body in different poses, um, we can generate quite accurate measurements um, for your body. So we've acquired this company and we're looking at building their capabilities into the Zalando app. Um, so this is, this is one aspect of it. Then, you know, looking toward the future, you know, and also setting expectations toward the far future because this is a space that's still in development. You can imagine a space where virtual reality also is really helping people to understand how certain articles will fit their body and that we can go beyond giving great size advice to also giving great fit advice. And fit at the end of the day is the, the basis of style. Yeah, can't, uh, can't uh, disagree there. Totally, I agree. <laughs> uh, thinking uh, a little bit, you know, uh, talking about the diversity and inclusion, and I've also seen like, you know, you're sharing a lot about it uh, during, uh, you know, in, in LinkedIn and stuff like that. Uh, I wanted to understand why is diversity, uh, diversity and inclusion important to you? <laughs> yeah, so this is a, this is a good question. Um, I mean, if you look at me on the surface, right? Like I'm, you know, I'm a cis white man from, a, from the United States um, who grew up in a middle-class family. Um, I have a lot of privilege. And um, so, you know, so why should I be passionate about that? Um, but I, I think it's important to, to approach the topic with a lot of humility and I, I'm, I'm still very much on a learning journey, but I think 
if I think about why, why it means so much to me, mm -hmm. I think it's because I've always felt like an outsider. I, I grew up, um, I grew up Mennonite, which is a certain kind of Christian group, a small Christian group that's like associated with the Amish, which some people know who like, um, they ha even have like kind of a, a cult of persecution in a certain way. They, they, we have like this book called Martyrs Mirrors, which is about like, you know, how, you know, how in Germany um, they were like, you know, uh, tortured and like, thus fled the country and stuff. Um, so there's a certain kind of even, um, I would say pride in being an outsider that came with the culture in which I grew up. And um, I think there's other aspects also. I mean, I'm, I'm an introvert in like various things. So I think, you know, as a teenager, I was also kind of picked on or made fun of in school. And I, I think I always felt a little bit like an outsider. And I, so I feel like building inclusion is important for all of us. And I think if you look at it intellectually, diversity is also just an enabler for doing better business, right? More diversity of perspectives brings better ideas um, and, and all of this. And I think, I mean, diversity is also, it's becoming closer and closer to many of us um, personally as well, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's even, if, even if we're within certain kind of categories of, um, of privilege, um, we have, you know, nieces and nephews or children or, you know, friends who are outside those boundaries. So I think that that's kind of what um, has attracted me to really championing more diversity and inclusion within the workplace. And how do you bring that to customer experience? Good question. So um, we have, <laughs> with Alanda, we've now founded a new design team that's uh, focused on diversity and inclusion within the customer experience. Mm -hmm. So um, my colleague Lana Kriggs um, is looking for a designer to join them on this journey. Mm -hmm. And um, it will be a very interesting journey. So I think, again, I think we should approach it with humility. We're at the very beginning of this. And I think it's better that we do things rather than talk about them <laughs> before we do them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, if you, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the fashion experience, there's plenty of opportunities to, to focus more on diversity, to focus more on inclusive experiences in, in, in many different aspects of what that means. And I think you can already see it in, into a certain, to a large degree, actually, even maybe in the, the um, marketing that Zolando does. Um, and, but marketing is easier to, easier to do, right? I mean, to do, to do diversity at the product level to scale it, especially yeah. at the scale that Zalando is, yeah. is really, really hard. I mean, we have millions of articles um, and, and, and displaying each of those on a diverse set of models um, is, a, is, a really big, is a really big challenge. So, and I mean, within Size and Fit as well, we have, you know, we're working with data scientists to figure out, you know, how to create algorithms that, mm -hmm. you know, give people the best advice for their bodies. And then when you have bodies that are outliers, it's harder to find that data. So, you know, so, so the, it's also just, a, just even from a, from a data science perspective, um, it's a really interesting problem of how do we get enough data to create systems that are not biased? I mean, there's all sorts of um, AI and bias stuff out there to, to consume, which is super interesting. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Uh... I want to now talk about like, you know, the motivations and the times, you know, uh, we hit blocks when we are taking on, on huge challenges or even, you know, sometimes when we are trying to solve certain problems, we are hit by a roadblock. And these times, uh, you know, personally, uh, what has been there for you that motivates you and keeps you going? Mm. I mean, what motivates me is, is keeping in mind, you know, the why. I mean, like I said, I have this, you know, this stand here with my personal mission statement sitting by my desk and so forth. So I think, you know, coming back to the why is something that's important in cases like that. Sometimes it's just shutting off, like, you know, going for a jog or meditating or whatever it is for you personally. Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, for me, sometimes I have to walk away from something and come back to it the next morning. Like, Often my, my best work is like, you know, from like 5 to 8 a.m. <laughs> um, because that's kind of when my mind is clean. 
Yeah, so talking about like, you know, right now we talked about uh, motivation. Now let's talk about inspiration. So where do you draw your inspirations from? From the breath. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I mean, like uh, for me, I mean, most of my inspiration comes through meditation. Um, um, I feel like, it, like, like I said, cleaning out the mind um, really helps for the brain to work in an organic way that we don't control, which is really amazing. Our, our brains are really amazing if we let them do their job. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, you sound more Indian than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, and I think it's also like within the work context, right? I mean, it's important that it also doesn't sound esoteric. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking into ways that we can bring more secular mindfulness into the company and this kind of thing. So I'm really, I, I really came at meditation from more of a religious angle, even though I'm like we talked about actually personally we chatted briefly before this i'm not a i'm not a believer um but i consider myself religious so i so i'm kind of a religious atheist in a way like i, I feel like there's um, certain practices and habits and ethics that one can engage in to make life more meaningful and um so but putting that aside because i think within the workplace it's also important to keep it super secular right so so I think speaking the right language around this um, is really important. Um, now, just talking about like, you know, going back into the past and you did talk about like, you know, uh, when you look at your past, uh, you think that, okay, uh, even if it was not, not intentional, it was, you know, uncertain pattern. And uh, many of these things, you know, like in life, I believe that uh, it only happens when we look back, right? Uh, when mm. we realize that there was a pattern, there was like, to all the madness, there was a certain method that at that point of time, maybe we did not realize it unfolded for us. Mm -hmm. um, so in this regards, I want to ask, like, if you would go back, you know, to a five year younger self or a younger self for that matter, what are the like some suggestions or advice that you would give to that younger self? Mm. So I'm scanning back through different, different times. And the main advice I would give myself you're good, <laughs> you know, like, you're good. Um, I think, you know, some things come to mind in terms of like, you know, at this point you could have done this or at this point you could have done that. Um, but I, and I, I don't even don't think don't worry may have, maybe have not been relevant even because I don't think I was ever so worried, you know? So I, I, don't, I didn't need that advice. Don't worry about it, it's all gonna be good. It's just basically just like, you know, confidence to, to go along with the flow. And, and, and follow my own career path. Mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder if I would have told myself um, to join Amazon in 1996, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure, you know, because I took a different path. I, I mean, I was working in Seattle um, for a startup and one of my colleagues became a data, database administrator at Amazon. I was like, oh, Amazon, golden handcuffs, you know, like already then there was this idea of like, you know, or I think that was 1997 actually. There's this idea of like the golden handcuffs and I'm like, I don't want that. You know, there's no way I want those golden handcuffs. Just looking back, I'm like, wow, if I would have done the golden handcuffs for five years, uh, things would have looked really different in my life financially. <laughs> but I think um, in terms of how my life unfolded and moving to a different country, learning a new language, all these, you know, meeting the people I've met along the way, I don't think I would want to go back and interfere with my younger self. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, everything, experiences shapes us. And sometimes, you know, for the better uh, in our lives, sometimes we might not have taken a certain path, right? Um, very reflective process, I, I believe. Like, sometimes I go back, while I might not change, but like, you know, some things I would say, like, you know, I think we were so much braver than we were young. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Right. Yeah, keep keep up the bravery. Maybe that's what I tell you know, like five or ten years back is you know, tap into that bravery you had when you were twenty. Go for it. <laughs> um, now, I'd like uh, uh, some of your recommendations. You've given some of them in your presentation. They would be super useful for mm -hmm. you know, people looking at a certain way uh, towards the uh, you know professional development. But in general, like you know, if you could advise uh, for like some media, maybe some some good movies or like some books or some podcast or anything? Like, do you have like some recommendation for the young and budding designers here? Right. Um, well, since you mentioned movies, actually just I, the last movie I saw was actually a German movie, which I don't know if you can watch outside this country. Um, but if you can, um, it's called Ich bin dein Mensch, which is like, I am your human. 
Um, and it's about, um, you know, like this scientist who gets to order her perfect man um, um, as like a two week uh, experiment. <laughs> and it's, it's really, it's really both funny and insightful and good. Um, so, so if this, if this German movie by Maria Schroeder is the director, um, um, I am your human, if that's available in English, I recommend that. Um, mm, in terms of podcasts, I mean, I think I'm not very original. I think Brene Brown is like the first person that comes to mind, which, you know, I think everybody already listens to Brene Brown. So <laughs> maybe not worth saying. I mean, and um, yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, within the design community, there's certain voices that, you know, are really nice. I mean, Don Norman is still interesting to, to listen to or, or Jacob Nielsen or Julie Cho. Um, all these people are, are kind of the standard inspirations. Mm. If people are, I mean, if you're looking for something that's more like coffee table reading, like to just kind of relax after a day at work, um, this may have been stressful. Um, there's this um, book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball um, which is kind of um, a nice, just funny look at uh, the design career um, and taking an uh, interesting view of it. Wow, uh, thank you so much. I think, you know, you, we, we uh, could really love the recommendations I'm going to look at. I think it was so good today, uh, you know, chatting with you, uh, you know, uh, Jay, it was really a, such a pleasure. Um, um, and we really thank you for all the thoughts you shared with us today. I personally resonated uh, with all of them um, and really thought that you're doing a great work. Uh, and for that, uh, there's a small uh, token of love and appreciation from our side. And that's just word is all we can give at this point of time. So you want to confer upon you the title of Inspiring Designer. Thanks for <laughs> inspiring us. Well, I'm, I'm still breathing. So thank you. Thank you, Karambari, for hosting. And um, thanks so much. Folks watching us today. I hope this has inspired you and stay inspired, keep designing. Until next time. Thank you guys.